All right, intoxicating energy. Our last uh, talk discussion of the series. It's been a great one. Um, intoxicating energy from Marianne Williamson. You know that name? Yeah. Did you see she's running for president in 2020? She is. Uh, I asked her to come here, and, and she's really busy, but she got her start here uh, years ago. She says this, people don't live in Los Angeles because we are tired, we are tied to the same old, same old. We live in Los Angeles because of the intoxicating energy of new beginnings that permeate our city. So what we've done here, if this is your first time, just so you know, um, we've taken a basic mythology course uh, with these categories. And we've layered that on to Los Angeles. What is the mythology of Los Angeles? What are the Los Angeles stories that move us, shape us, that we live by, that we hold, that hold us? And these are the unique Los Angeles features of those previous categories. So it goes from the town of the Queen of the Angels to uh, boozy transcendentalists to um, the city burning last week. Um, and all through there. Tonight is future myths, and it's appropriate that apocalypse becomes before the future uh, because there are things after the apocalypse. Uh, just read The Road by Cormac McCarthy or watch any apoc apocalypse film. The story can't end there. Uh, it's got to keep going, and so what does the future look like? Future myths are really interesting. I think they're analogous to creation myths in that they're kind of inverse creation myths. Creation myths are not about the past. Creation myths are about the present, but they use a rhetorical feature of the past to support the present, to support the way things are. Future myths are the same. They are about the present. They're about the anxieties of the present, the hopes of the present, um, projected into the future. All right, so they're necessary but flawed storytelling. It almost, these stories rarely become, uh, the, the future rarely becomes what the stories articulate. I mean, sometimes it gets close, but that's not the point, because the future myths, like creation myths, are for us now. Creation myths, in creation myths, we cast backward to find support for what we believe and how we function in society. In future myths, we cast uh, forward, did I say, uh, cast backward on creation myths, cast forward with future myth. It, it doesn't matter that it never comes out this way, all right? So I always wanted, I used to get frustrated, used to get frustrated with politics. Um, <laughs> God, yeah, let's not go there. Um, but these pundits, I was like, dude, how do you get to say whatever you want to say and nobody calls you on it? And I'm like, okay. And I proposed in my mind, because there's no one to pr propose this to, but I, I thought there should be scorecards for pundits. So if you say X is going to happen, then, and it doesn't happen, you got you get a zero, you know? And it, if it does happen, you get a point. But, and you know, they should post, they should put that on the Chiron whenever a pundit is talking, right? Yeah, he has a score of minus three, you know, or whatever. Um, we love to do this, though, because we need to do this. Um, I remember telling someone um, in a relationship, well, I, I, I don't live in the future. Really? She said. I'm like, okay, you're right. I do have, I do have an idea of what's going to happen tomorrow, what I'd like to happen tomorrow. But the future, like the past, is unreal. The past is unreal because you can't experience it. It's gone. The future is unreal because you can't experience it. But that doesn't mean we don't experience it in our stories. 
our future myths, our creation myths. We embody those and live them out. And so that's, that's where they get their traction, is not from their accuracy, but from their mythology, by the fact that there are stories that we live out. Many of you are probably here in Los Angeles, some of you, because of a story. I'm here because of a story um, that I wanted to live out. And I didn't know this was part of it, so that's cool. Uh, but that's, that's the beauty of future myths, is that they can surprise you in terrible and wonderful ways. But what sh the story you're telling yourself about the future shapes the reality of the future in ways that are difficult to trace, but almost never in the ways you imagine. Now, the future myths are often balanced, are drawn from golden age myths. And we've talked about this a little bit before. Uh, there's the great story of Arcus, who was, um, he was Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And, I'm not going to go into it because the important thing about Arcus is that he eventually, uh, he almost kills his mother being uh, out hunting. And uh, there's Zeus and Hera jealousy and Zeus throws them both up into the air and they become constellations. So that's the story. But he becomes um, associated at one point with Arcadia, right? And that is the classic golden age, right? In fact, there's an Arcadia, California. There's a lot of Arcadias because it's a good name, name for Arcus. Utopian vision of pastoralism and harmony with nature. Uh, it comes from the land of Arcus, the, the human figure we were talking about who becomes a, a constellation. Uh, it becomes eventually a poetic byword for uh, the idyllic vision of an unspoiled wilderness, a utopia, uh, as a matter of fact. Virgil, the great Roman poet in his Eclogues, writes this, Arcadians skilled in song will sing my woes upon the hills, softly shall my bones repose if you in future sing my loves upon your pipe. So it's that sense of in, in Virgil there, it's that sense of future utopia or golden age, uh, but it, it mainly refers to the past, trying to get back to this past, to this Edenic-like uh, reality. Now, many of you are probably noticing that painting um, that is titled In Arcadia, Et in Arcadia Ego, which uh, is a favorite painting of esoteric-minded um, folks about just what it means. Uh, does it mean that, yes, even in Arcadia you die because it's a, it's a headstone and that's what's carved into the headstone? Or does it mean uh, something deeper, uh, something behind the veil of Isis there in that little saying? Um, the Mahabharata, the Krita Yuga, uh, the first and perfect age. Men neither bought nor sold during this age. There were no poor and no rich. Uh, there were no poor and no rich. There was no need to labor because all that men required was obtained by the power of the will. The chief virtue was the abandonment of all worldly desires. And the Krita Yuga, that time was without disease. There was no lessening with the years. There was no hatred or vanity or evil thought whatsoever. No sorrow, no fear. All humankind could attain to the supreme blessedness. Now, the best example probably of the balanced golden ages is Christianity, which begins in paradise in Eden, which is a, a Persian word, word, word sorry, that means walled city, which is interesting in itself. Uh, paradise as walled city. You may remember that everything was perfect until a woman screwed it up according to the most uh, patriarchal of Christian theology. I think we've discussed this before. If we're going to make a legal case here, Adam's equally culpable. 
I, I was a juror, I know these things. <laughs> um, he was there, the text says he was there with her, so we can't prosecute Eve, legally anyway. Theologically, you can do whatever the hell you want. Um, but you, you begin in this paradise in the story world, and you end in a new heaven and new earth in the book of Revelation, which is also called Apocalypse, right? So that's a good case in point. The very book Apocalypse ends with a, an incredible future myth about what it's going to be like. And guess what? It's going to be like, it's going to be recognizable, right? Um, which is why it's a myth about the present. And the whole book of Revelation is really a polemic against Rome, and in fact against uh, a s factors of the, current, of the Christian church at that time. But we won't get into that. The Enlightenment is a future myth. Uh, I was just talking about this with, with Brad earlier, um, and we've mentioned it in here before. The Enlightenment, this sense that we are at the zenith of human knowledge, we have cast aside our theological superstitions, and we now have a scientific method, and it can produce things like trains, like radio, like, um, well, armaments, but we're not going to need those, are we? Um, germ and biological warfare, we've got that, but, you know, we're better than that until 1914, when the Great War destroys not only so many lives, but also this story. And the, the general consensus is that, that it gives birth to literary modernism, where Joyce and Wolf start to turn inside because it's too, too ugly and too uh, tragic to look outside. So let's turn in here and stream of consciousness and other um, methods of writing are born. Utopias don't need a golden age in front of them. In fact, most of them don't. Uh, but they are interesting. They are the classic future myth. Um, it means, there it is in Greek, not, the O-U prefix means not, and topos, you may know, means place. So no place, not a place. There, this doesn't exist. So there you go. This is, is existing in the story world. I'm telling you a story about a place that doesn't exist, right? Why? Because I, it's going to be different. It's going to be so different from what we experience here and now that you, it, it's just no place. You can't imagine it. We get this with Plato's Republic, um, which you may have read in college. Uh, it's, it's an interesting place. It's not a democracy, of course. It's a timocracy. Uh, in the Republic, you, the only people who can lead are philosopher kings, um, so cool. Your philosophy degree might finally mean something. Um, and the philosopher kings are surrounded by the guardians because these are, these are people of strength but not as much intelligence or wisdom as the philosopher kings and then there's everybody else. Okay, we kind of know that <laughs> setup. Um, the philosopher king contemplates the forms all day. Nice. All right. Um, still a, a foundational future myth for Western culture is this idea of how a society should work. Augustine's going to employ it in his work, City of God, which again, these future myths often are generated out of tragedy, um, and even little apocalypses, if you will. Uh, because, again, you have to imagine the next story, the next stage of existence. And so for Augustine, it was the Romans, uh, the Visigoths, sorry, coming over the walls in 410, and the sack of Rome finally complete. Um, and this is 410, remember, so... Rome has been an empire for centuries and has, by this time, become the center of Christianity. And St. Augustine is its greatest spokesperson of the time, and Christians in that era had associated with Rome 
ironically, with the kingdom of God. But it can't be if you've got the Visigoths there sacking the city. And so he writes this majestic city of God where he articulates a vision where Christians, he says, there we are peregrines. We are, we are lost. We're strangers in this world um, because our real home is in the heavens, in the city of God. You may know, know uh, the word from Thomas More, um, um, not a friend of Henry VIII, that dude. Um, he, he wrote a book called Utopia, where it's set on an island, which is interesting. So you're going back to that paradise notion, he's got to wall off Utopia um, and Golden Age places. There are no laws. Everyone learns a skill which benefits the community. People work only six hours a day. There's no crime. There's a tolerance for all religion in all of its forms. So yes, this is Bernie Sanders land. Um, and it's awesome. And he, he got a lot of flack for it, especially later when people are like, oh my God, that's communism. You should read the New Testament, dude, if you want to see communism. Um, in Acts, it says that the first Christians shared everything and took as they needed and all that. Uh, of course, Francis Bacon builds upon Moore's work. Uh, and it's the same story, right? Um, in the future, greedy, morally corrupt, and a militaristic civilization falls. The only survival is an island where wisdom is preserved and enlarged upon by truly philanthropic and philosophical uh, leaders. Um, this is Ben Salem, he calls it. Basically, it's the new Atlantis, is what he calls it. <clears throat> um, of course, it's really a metaphor for a state of being a higher consciousness. Um, there was also e Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, um, which I haven't read, but I've heard a lot about. Uh, the story goes like this, AD 2000, isn't this the fun part of apocalypse and future myths? And we're going to see it again later, how they projected things so far out in the future that now we're living some of them, like 1984, for example, came and went, or maybe didn't go. I don't know. Let's, we'll talk about it if you want. By AD 2000 and looking backward, the universal reign of brotherhood has arrived, right? War has dis disappeared, and so have advertisements. <laughs> there may be some relation there. Uh, retail stores gone, servants gone, garbage, political parties, public corruption, state government, lawyers, armies and navies, jails, professional athletes, uh, labor unions, banks, and money all gone. Because you can't have those things and have a utopia. Uh, crime, insanity, and suicide are rare. Social distinctions dissolved into equality. The state manages all industrial activity and provides jobs for everyone. People retire at 45. <laughs> yeah. what? And spend the rest of their lives in leisure. Harmony between the sexes has become perfect. Yeah, harmony between the sexes, okay. Everyone is educated and intelligent. Public, that's probably why the sexes are harmonized, but uh, public spirit has overcome selfishness. All the people share the wealth equally and want for nothing in a society free of the conflicts that have characterized all of previous humanity. Now, um, there are, I suppose, well, at least one Conservative utopia, anybody? Thank you. And do we describe that, David? Yeah, and what happens in that society? The titans of industry stop running the world go to Colorado. To Aspen, no doubt. a society of super stone-faced, selfish people who work for each other themselves somehow. Yeah, yeah, no, that's close enough. I haven't read it. I think I'll live a full life without it. But that's basically it. Um, but but notice notice the 
notice the features here of utopias. They, they are not selfish by and large. They, they are about communal, uh, not just community, but a thriving, vibrant community with values. There's, there's something interesting going on there. But let's not forget that we also have dystopias. So Animal, animal Farm, in particular, 1984, of course, Orwell's brilliant um, dystopic novel uh, that gets, um, that kind of has a counter in Brave New World, Huxley's Brave New World, to, uh, they're right around the same time. I think Brave New World is actually first, isn't it, 30 something? And 1984 is, I think, 1948. Mm. Yeah. Um, anyway, really interesting. Uh, comparison between the two. Uh, Fahrenheit 451, our own Ray Bradbury. Um, yes, typing that out in the basement of the Central Library. And of course, a book um, I've been teaching for years that I thought people would forget about, but it has a resurgence for some strange reason called The Handmaid's Tale. What about who? Oh, or yeah, Margaret Atwood? Yes. Yeah, I don't know that one. Is that a dystopia? Yes. Yep. Did I see she's writing a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale? Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, there's our own Octavia Butler's uh, from Pasadena, The Parable of the Sower, and, of course, you know, The Hunger Games and Blade Runner and Terminator. You know this genre uh, of dystopias. Um, well, we can talk about it in the discussion, but I still see the dystopias as a future myth with similar values because they're just setting the, the story world against the values, right? Um, so, for example, even with uh, Cormac McCarthy, uh, who is a dark, dark writer, uh, even he and The Road... Um, he doesn't do this in Blood Meridian. There's no redemption in Blood Meridian. But in the road, after the apocalypse, it's a father and a son trying to find their humanity. Um, and that's the whole purpose of them moving. They keep moving, right? And facing against cannibals and murderers and other people, um, here's a father who only wants to get his son to the sea because there's hope in this dystopia. All right, the, the contemporary mythology of the future is science fiction. Um, it's, it's, more, it's, it's almost directly overlap with mythology, I think, because it's pointing to the future. And um, again, that's about the present, but, but yeah, it's about the present. And so those creation myths, they get tangled up in history. Yeah, and a myth should never get tangled up in history because it's, that's when it's no longer a myth, I guarantee you. If it, if it becomes historical, if uh, people are saying, well, this really happened, it's dead. But the science fiction myths, they, they have nothing to be tested against. And so I think they're very much more alive. Uh, and they will always be alive because they're always out there. They're always pushing ahead. Mary Shelley, the brilliant Mary Shelley, um, wife of Percy Shelley, um, dark, dark story. Uh, we actually had a dis lecture discussion on it uh, last year. Incredible writer um, who created the genre of science fiction, as far as I'm concerned, um, the way Poe created the detective story. And you may remember Frankenstein was the result of a um, group of people, uh, Percy Shelley and Mary and Lord Byron, who got uh, rained in on a lake. They were at a lake um, on vacation, and they couldn't go out. So they said, hey, let's tell ghost stories and see who can tell the best. And I imagine everyone, you know, these great romantic poets telling their ghost stories. And then Mary Shelley comes out with Frankenstein, and I just imagine them putting their pens down because, okay, you win. 
we lose, <laughs> Mary. Uh, the world loses because of this vision. No, no, it's it's just a really dark vision, but it's it's the first one to incorporate really what was happening at the time, which was the science of galvanism, uh, anatomy, and other things. Uh, Jung, Carl Jung, had a lot to say. Well, I had some things to say about science fiction and and even UFOs. He, he says this in regard to basically future myths. Modern myth cannot be simply a representation of contemporary reality. Yes, thank you. It must resonate on multiple levels. Yes. Jung considers the living myth of flying saucers, for example, a golden opportunity to quote, um, see how in a dark and difficult time for humanity a miraculous tale grows up of an attempted intervention by extraterrestrial heavenly powers and at this very time when human fantasy is seriously considering the possibility of space travel and of visiting or even invading other planets. Campbell, Joseph Campbell saw this too. He thought the, the, the new mythology be, would be one of space. He, he put great stock in that photo taken from the moon back at the earth where you could see the earth as one. It's equivalent to uh, the child seeing itself in the mirror for the first time. You, you see a wholeness. You see Jung's self, the individuated self, on a cosmic scale. In fact, he says, Jung says that this is what science fiction, con contemporary myth, does. It provides an order, deliverance, salvation, and wholeness to the present world. And you'll see that, and you heard already with the stories of utopia, there's a coherence there. And you get to do that with future myths because the future's not real. So the future hasn't happened. And so you get to create this story world that hangs together perfectly, right? And you've covered all your bases. Everybody's happy and there's, the sexes are um, getting along and there's no lawyers, you get to create that world uh, because it's not here. He continues, Jung does. Um, I'm sorry, this is not Jung. I'm moving off to Olaf Stapledon, an uh, early science fiction writer. He says this, our aim is not merely to create aesthetically admirable fiction. We must achieve neither mere history nor mere fiction. You see? neither history nor fiction. It was Aristotle who said that uh, theater drama for him was greater than history or philosophy because history and philosophy, history was bound by what happened and philosophy was bound by what's true, but theater was not bound at all. This is Stapledon re-engaging that notion. We must achieve neither mere history nor mere fiction, but, a, but myth, a true myth, right? is one which, within the universe of a certain culture, expresses richly and often perhaps tragically the highest aspirations possible within a culture. Tragically, because as soon as you put it out there, you see how far away from it you are, the higher you aspire. H.G. Wells, another great science fiction writer, his time machine is, is still a worthy, fascinating read. He says this, it is possible to believe that all the past is but the beginning of a beginning, and that all that is and has been is but the twilight of the dawn. It is possible to believe that all that the human mind has ever accomplished is but the dream before awakening. Yeah, nice. That's what science fiction, that's what future myths can do. That man, they can encompass everything. This is Neil Postman uh, talking about that, that creative tension between Orwell and Huxley uh, with 1984 and Brave New World. Listen to this. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared, that those, uh, feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Ouch. 
Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared that we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy porgy. I don't know what that is, but okay. And the centrifugal bumble puppy. You know what that is, Luke? Yeah, it's a reference to uh, his utopian book, which not a lot of people read. Husbands? Huxley's. Huxley's. Yeah, Got it. Book called Island. Oh, right. I highly, recommend, I highly recommend it. It's a, an island where there's sort of a Hindu, Buddhist inspired culture. They use psychedelics as part of their spiritual development. They raise families together. Talks more about the social development. Excellent. Aldous Huxley, yeah. The Island. Excellent, thank you. See, in our bookstore? Oh, well done, bro. <laughs> thank you, that's excellent. Um, Arthur Clarke, it has yet to be proven that intelligence has any survival value. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the great Morpheus. This is your last chance, Neo. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> awesome. What about Los Angeles? and future myth. Well, you remember, we, we were born in a future myth, the myth of Ramona, the novel Ramona by Helen Hunt Jackson. That produced tourism. That and other things produced tourism. And the tourists, now we're talking about the late 19th century, um, <clears throat> that produced um, tourism and, that, and they in turn produced stories, myths about Southern California and Los Angeles. The boosters who were around and as the city was growing and people started coming in, by 1876 we get the railroad and these guys, they're always there ready to turn a phenomenon into a buck. And so the boosters generate their own stories. Um, they're well, I don't know if they're different. I was going to say they were different. I don't know how different they were. They were, they were stories about this place that got people to move here and in turn lose a lot of money sometimes as their real estate speculation falters. Um, and then the railroads got in on this. Some actually uh, really interesting artwork done by the railroads to promote Los Angeles. And um, I think I told you before, there was a railroad fare war uh, in the late 19th century where it ended up, you could, you could take a train from Iowa to Los Angeles for a dollar. And they did, and they came. And yeah, and they're still coming. Um, the great Carrie McWilliams has a whole chapter on uh, what he calls the politics of utopia. Now, Kerry McWilliams, I've quoted him a lot in this series because he's the best writer on Los Angeles. Uh, 1946, Southern California, an island upon the land. Um, and you, anybody writing on Los Angeles, you will hear them echo Kerry McWilliams, I guarantee you. Um, he was also um, a fierce advocate for labor. So this chapter, The Politics of Utopia, is about <clears throat> the open shop movement in Los Angeles that prevented labor unions from forming, among other things. But he also has, he also marries that kind of material reality to Los Angeles' sense of, well, of itself, as we've talked about now for 10 weeks. Uh, he says this, Los Angeles itself is a kind of utopia a vast metropolitan community built in a semi-arid region, a city based upon improvisation, words, propaganda, and boosterism. Damn right, good, good, good observation. Improvisation, we are a city of improvisation. 
words propaganda, propaganda and boosterism. I didn't know this, but in February 20th, 1934, on February 20th, 1934, the Utopian Society was founded in Los Angeles. 1934. It's an interesting time to found a utopian society, isn't it? Right after the Great Depression, uh, which, which still affected Los Angeles, but perhaps not as much. Uh, this is McWilliams again. As a social movement, <laughs> I love this. You know, in the future, things just change form. They don't really change. <laughs> Listen, as a social movement, the Utopian Society had two novel features. It utilized the chain letter technique of business to recruit members. It used social media, right? And both in ritual and in structure, the organization was patterned after the American Secret Society or fraternal group. Genius, right? You do social media for the time. You do the chain letter. You've got to have the right technology. You've got to have the right media strategy. But then when you bring people in, you give them an esoteric experience akin to that of the Masons and Theosophists, etc. Now, you're probably thinking this was one of the many groups that rose and and then disappeared in Los Angeles in the early 20th century. And you would be wrong, as I was wrong, as I kept reading. It was founded in 1934 in February. By the end of 1934, the Utopian Society of Los Angeles had 500,000 members. I don't, that's a significant portion of the population in 1934. Uh, so I'm not sure how they're counting that, but they had 250 meetings a night. This is Kerry McWilliams. He's done his research. Um, I, I think he means Los Angeles County, but still. 250 meetings a night all over Los Angeles County of the Utopian Society. One, meeting, one summer evening, there were 1,063 1, meetings in one summer evening all over Los Angeles County of the Utopian Society. The first public meeting in that year, remember they started in February, the first public meeting was June 23rd, 1934 at the Hollywood Bowl. 25,000 people packed the Hollywood Bowl to join the Utopian Society and hear about their ideals. And then, as McWilliams notes, the promoters of the society were completely surprised by its success and never did seem to know just what to do with or how to direct the phenomenal enthusiasm they had aroused. So you, they, they were genius at the beginning. They set up these four stages you had to go through, right? And so people, you know, they wanted this. It's a future myth that that people were dying to, to live out. And so they went through the four stages very quickly. And then they're like, okay, what's next? And they're like, uh, we haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> we don't have a future story for that. Uh, so it just diminished and kind of withered away. Isn't that interesting? I love this city. What's up, Wendy? Don't forget, we still have the thought gold arrived in Santa Monica. You mean Venice? Yeah. Yeah. Is, well, Abbott Kenny certainly thought it was. He wanted to recreate Venice there. Do you? <laughs> what if they bring those scooters with it so that you can have the scooter? No. Yeah, the Venice Canal system was actually much larger when it was in the early 20th century. All right, but we we can't avoid this. There is one story that is this future myth of Los Angeles.
Next subject, Kowalski Leon, engineer waste disposal. File section, new employee, six days. Call Mr. Webber. Come in. We've, uh, I've invoked Norman Klein's history of forgetting a few times, and, and this is a good time to as well. And we're going to go to Mike Davis, too, so strap in. <laughs> it's going to get dark. Um, uh, this is from Norman Klein's The History of Forgetting, a, a short chapter called Building Blade Runner. And he said, it begins this way, in February 1990, at a public lecture series, I'm quoting, on art in Los Angeles, three out of five of the leading urban planners agreed that they hoped that someday LA would look like the film Blade Runner. <laughs> the audience, safe and comfortable in the Pacific Design Center, buzzed audibly with concern. <laughs> One could practically hear the rumors starting that it was time to sell that condo by the beach and move to Seattle, Brad. <laughs> Um, he does a, an interesting analysis of Blade Runner that's, um, well, it's interesting. I'm not sure I buy it all, but let me give you just a sense of it. Um, well, first of all, he starts off, the, the first four minutes are the film. Uh, okay. All right, the first four minutes are amazing, but I don't know that that's the whole film. But okay, in terms of this, the special effects, he says, these fir first four minutes represent layers of nostalgia built each by different technology from a different era. The bottom layer is an old-fashioned movie set out of the 30s and 40s. Okay, that's an interesting observation. I think that holds up, as you can see in that image. Uh, and as you remember from the rest of the film, after the first four minutes, he, he calls it future noir. Um, and by the way, we're going to do this series next year in the fall as well. And I think we have to talk about L.A. noir uh, as a religious, philosophical experience as well. He says this, we remember the old 30s neighborhoods long since destroyed and imagine them as primeval sources for the immigrant. For the, sorry, for the immigrant nightmares after the apocalypse, after the decline of continental American civilization. It has been said that nostalgia works only, excuse me, when the original experience has been forgotten. Uh, he's invoking Baudrillard there. So that the container is empty enough to fill with wide-ranging anxieties about what we have lost. He calls the rain there, Noir rain. Okay, that's cute. Um, but, but then he says this. He and Mike Davis, man, they, they are into this Blade Runner film as uh, a metaphor for Los Angeles. Klein says, the Blade Runner rain becomes the mark of the devil. In this case, a devil of humankind's own making. The smog finally destroying the desert climate itself. It is, as we've said all along, a city of the hyper-real, an unreal city, as T.S. Eliot put it. And this is Norman Klein's version of that. The Blade Runner reality is drifting farther away. At the same time, the Blade Runner shopping mall, you know, where he goes to have, uh, have dinner, is growing more tangible, like a mock journey through a museum installation about starvation in America, like the shows about homelessness, like Blade Runner discussions at the Pacific Design Center. We watch the future merging like an air conditioning unit designed to obscure the poverty and confusion that lay only a few blocks away. We do not want to be isolated, but we do not want to be singled out for misery either. We wait like the Blade Runner policeman to be called into action with all the futility that goes with it. An old-fashioned film noir. What good can we do? But all in all, we would rather eat off the street, mix with the locals a little, but not too much. Just let the crisis pass us like a visual symphony. As Baudelaire provide, explained, anywhere, anywhere, just out of this world. And he concludes the essay. The film Blade Runner has indeed achieved something rare in the history of cinema. 
It has become a paradigm for the future of cities, of artists, for artists across the disciplines. It is undoubtedly the film most requested in art and film classes I teach, whether to environmental designers, illustrators, fine artists, photographers, or filmmakers. When it came out in 1982, many critics called it um, the success of style over substance or style over story. But the hum of that Vangelis score against the skyline of LA in 2019, as the film opens, continues to leave a strange impact on artists and filmmakers. I'll be interested to hear from you if that's the case. Now, um, getting too close to the end here, but we've got to, got to have, let Mike Davis have his say here. Um, he says, every Ameri this is uh, from Ecology of Fear, uh, a chapter on Blade Runner called Beyond Blade Runner. Every American city, he says, has its official insignia and slogan. Some have municipal mascots, colors, songs, birds, trees, even rocks, but Los Angeles has adopted all by itself an official nightmare. <laughs> Virtually all ruminations about the future of Los Angeles now take for granted the dark imagery of Blade Runner as a possible, if not inevitable, terminal point in the land of sunshine. He continues about a dark reality. Ridley Scott's particular gigantesque caricature may capture ethnocentric anxieties about polyglottism run amok. Should I read that again? <laughs> it's basically racial concerns. Um, this, it, indicated by languages especially, but it fails to, imagine it to imaginatively engage the real Los Angeles landscape, especially the great unbo unbroken plains of aging bungalows, dingbats, and ranch-style homes as it socially and physically erodes into the 21st century. That's right. Blade Runner is too optimistic for Mike Davis. <laughs> and he goes in into great detail in this chapter that I, I'm not going to share with you, but he calls it a Gibsonian map. He does a Gibsonian map of Los Angeles, as in William Gibson, neuromancer, right? Uh, speaking of science fiction, uh, a map to a future of Los Angeles that is already half born. Here's a, here's a review of that section, so, so I don't have to, uh, we don't have to wade through it. Projecting uh, a Gibsonian map of future LA and drawing somewhat from the work of Ernest Burgess and his diagram projection of Chicago from the 20s. So this was a, a kind of concentric circle map that shows various populations and behaviors of the city. And let's see, Davis brings current socioeconomic political factors in to bear on his vision. We see our cities becoming technologically and physically segregated into zones of protection and or terror. And Davis is genius at this, uh, at describing Los Angeles. For you, you may remember City of Courts, where he talks about the architecture of downtown as basically a fortress of solitude. We have begun to build cages to sustain ourselves in an urban landscape grown increasingly hostile due to vast economic disparities. This is 1990. Uh, the rich live in gated, protected regions, while the poor are relegated to a high-tech maintained urban wasteland that amounts to an anarchic prison colony. Current and potential municipal strategies provide ample evidence that these agencies of control are already established and need only augment themselves to perfect, in quotes, the dystopia. Okay, uh, he's not wrong. If, if you look through Mike Davis's eyes, um, and having lived downtown myself, I can see what he's talking about. There are zones, and they are, they represent different mergings, as Foucault would say, of knowledge slash power. But Pico Iyer, a really great writer, I don't know if you know him, he, he has an essay where he spent a week at LAX, which would make you pessimistic, if anything would. He is not so pessimistic, so let me read you some of his observations. Um, and his comments on the future of LA. 
based on his time in LAX. As with most social trends, especially the ones involving tomorrow, what is true of the world is doubly true of America, and what is doubly true of America is quadruply true of Los Angeles. LA legendarily has more ties than any city but Bangkok, more Koreans than any city but Seoul, more El Salvadorians than any city outside of San Salvador, more Druze than anywhere but Beirut. It is, at the very least, the easternmost outpost of Asia and the northernmost province of Mexico. It's almost too easy, he writes, to say that LAX is a perfect metaphor for LA. It's al always seemed perilously, perilously well chosen for a city whose main industries were traditionally thought to be laxity, LAX, or, <laughs> we're lax, and relaxation. LAX is at once a vacuum waiting to be colonized and a joyless theme park. Tomorrowland, Adventureland, and Fantasyland all at once. The theme building, designed, I believe, by William Pereira. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. At 201 World Way is a sad image of a future that never arrived. That's true, isn't it? A monument to the Kennedy era idealism and the thrusting modernity of the American empire when it was in its prime. Now it has the poignancy of an abandoned present with a price tag stuck to it. When you go there, and almost no one does, I've never been, but, uh, you are greeted by photos of Saturn's rings and Jupiter and its moons, by a plaque laid down by LBJ, and a whole set of symbols from the time when NASA was shooting for the heavens. Now the landmark building with its gourmet-type restaurant looks like a relic from a long time past when it must have looked like the face of the future. And I love this little story he tells here, so let me uh, indulge you too. Just as I was about to give up on LA as yesterday's piece of modernity, I got onto the shuttle bus that moves between the terminals in a never-ending loop. The seats next to me were taken by two tough-looking dudes from nearby South Central, who were riding the free buses and helping people on and off with their cases. Acting, I presume, on the safe assumption that the Japanese, say, new to the country and bewildered, had been warned beforehand to tip often and handsomely for every service they received. In between terminals, as a terrified looking Miss Kudo and her friend guarded their luggage en route from Nagoya to Las Vegas, the two gold-plated sharks talked about the Raiders' last game and the Lakers' next season. Then one of them, without warning, announced, the bottom line, man, is the spirit in you. When you work it out, you chill out. And like, you meditate in your spirit. You know what I mean? Meditation is recreation. Learn math. Follow your path. That's all I do, man. That's all I ever live for, learning about God, learning about Jesus. I'm possessed by that spirit. You know, I used to have all these problems with the flute and all, but when I heard about God, I learned about the body, the mind, and the flesh. People forget they don't know that the Bible isn't talking about the flesh. It's talking about the spirit, man. I was reborn in the spirit. His friend nodded. When you recreate, you meditate. Recreation is a spiritually uplifting experience. Yeah, man, when you do that, you allow the spirit to breathe. Because you're getting into the physical world. You're letting the spirit flow. You're helping the secretion of the endorphins in the brain. Nearby, Iyer notes, the soldiers of the Cross of Christ Church stood by the escalators, taking donations. And a man in a dog collar approached another stranger. That's a dog collar, not a priest collar. <laughs> I watched the hustlers allowing the spirit to breathe. I heard the Hare Krishna devotees plying their wares, and I spotted some Farrakhan flunkies collecting a dollar for a copy of their newspaper. The final call, redemption and corruption, was all around us in the air, and I thought, welcome to America, Miss Kudo. Welcome to Los Angeles. Isn't that good? And our old friend Rainer Banham from the Architecture of Four, Ecolo uh, Four Ecology, excuse me, the Brit who 
came here and fell in love with the freeways, uh, among other things, says that, writes this, the splendors and miseries of Los Angeles, the graces and the grotesqueries appear to me as unrepeatable as they are unprecedented. I share neither the optimism of those who see Los Angeles as the prototype of all future cities, nor the gloom of those who see it as a harbinger of universal doom. It is immediately apparent that no other city has ever been produced by such an extraordinary mixture of geography, climate, <clears throat> economics, demography, mechanics, and culture. Nor is it likely that an even remotely similar mixture will ever occur again. Future myths of Los Angeles. Future myths are necessary. We have to have them. They're almost always wrong. That's okay. They're about the present. They're about where we are now and trying to imagine a future that is inevitably filled with hope unless you're Mike Davis on a bad day. Um, no, they're inevitably, uh, Mike Davis even, he's measuring that against what's possible, see? So it's like a dystopia. With a dystopia, you still have to have values for the future. And yet the Los Angeles future myths are always going to be true. They're going to be true because they're going to be true to this city. The city of dynamic differences, constant, churning, roiling differences that we somehow manage to hold together in spite of in this city. We are west of the west. We are in a liminal zone. We're not western. We're beyond the west. We're in on the edge of the sacred. And we are an unreal city because we are the center of the imaginary and storytelling, and we will be for a while. We are the town of the queen of the angels. We believe in Los Angeles. We believe in the city, and we believe in all kinds of things, but mostly we believe that we can all coexist believing all those things. And that is amazing, yeah. isn't it? Thank you, Wendy. Um, God bless you. I, you know, I haven't had an amen from you for a while, but I'm working on it. And so to close out tonight and to close out this magnificent series, thank you for coming and, and talking about this with us. I thought you should hear Luis Rodriguez, who is the poet laureate of Los Angeles, about his, uh, hear him recite his poem, I Love Los Angeles. To say I love Los Angeles is to say I love its shadows and night lights, its meandering streets, the stretch of sunset colored beaches. It's to say I love the squawky wild parrots, the palm trees that fail to topple in robust winds, that within a half hour of LA Center, you can come work in snow, deserts, mountains, beaches. This is a multi layered city unceremoniously built on hills, valleys, ravines. Flying into Burbank Airport in the day, we observe gradations of trees and earth. A city seems to be an afterthought, skyscrapers popping up from the greenery, guarded by the mighty San Gabriels. Layers of history reach deep, run red, scarring the soul of the city, a land where Chinese were lynched, Mexican resistance fighters hounded, workers and immigrants exploited, Japanese removed to concentration camps, blacks forced from farmlands in the south, then segregated, diminished. Here also are blessed native lands, where first peoples like the Tatavium and Tongva bonded with nature's gifts. People of peace, deep stature, loving hands. Yet for all my love, I will support the poison dying, starting with Spanish settlers, the missions where 80% of natives who lived and worked in them died. To the richest murder of Indians during and after the gold rush, the worst.
Tribes, the slaughter of tribes in the country. From all manner of uprisings, the city of acceptance began to emerge. This is Riot City after all. More civil disturbances in Los Angeles in the past 100 years than any other city. To truly love LA, you have to see it with different eyes. A skew, perhaps, beyond the fantasy-induced Hollywood spectacles. L.A. is also known for the most violent street gangs, the largest skid row, the greatest number of poor. Yet I loved L.A. even during heroin-induced nods, or running down rain-soaked alleys or getting shot at, even when I slept in abandoned cars alongside the concrete river and during all-night movie showings in downtown Art Deco theaters. The city beckoned as I tried to escape the prison-like grip of its shallowness. Sun-soaked image, suburban quiet, all disarming, hiding the murderous heart that can be at its center. L.A. is also lovers' embraces, the most magnificent lies, the largest commercial ports, graveyard ships, poetry readings, murals, low riding culture, skateboarding, a sound that hybridized black, Mexican, as well as Asian and white migrant cultures. You wouldn't have musicians like Richie Valens, The Doors, War, Los Lobos, Charles Wright and the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band, Hiroshima, Motley Crue, W.A. or Quetzal, without Los Angeles. War, John Fante, Chester Himes, Charles Bukowski, Maricela Norte, and Wanda Coleman as its jester poets. I love that movie. I can't forget its smells. I love to make love in LA. It's a great city. The city without a candle. The world's most mixed metropolis of intolerance and divisions. How I love it, how I hate it. Zutu riots. Can't stay away. City of hunger, city of music. Ben Salazar, Rodney King. I like to kick its face in. Bone city, dry blood on walls, wildfires, taunting dove whales, car fumes and oil derricks, water thievery with every industry possible. And still in one industry town, lying by those majestic palm trees. And like its people, with solid roots, supple trunks, resilient. Thank you for coming out.